Only Rugby Show. We are back after the very first episode. So glad you all enjoyed it. Looking forward to getting the guys back in for another chat. Also, some housekeeping just to start off. Subscribe, pretty please, on YouTube. That would be great. Also, get involved on Facebook as well. We're going to be taking some questions from everyone uh, throughout these shows. So you can go on Twitter, Facebook, send something through for the guys, and we'll uh, try and get your questions answered. Let's bring them all in. Former Wallabies, Drew Mitchell and Stephen Hoyles, and also rugby commentator and rugby personality, Sean Maloney, joining us as well. Guys, what you been up to this week, Drew? Let's start with you. Um, not too much, actually. Just uh, getting out of my bike, getting in the lycra and uh, getting around town and being one of those guys that just goes <laughs> up, to the, up to the cafes and in my cleats and, uh, and gets the little <laughs> almond milk lattes and, uh, and just gets around in lycra. That's pretty much all I've been up to, really. Hey Drew, can I ask a quick question? What's sure. more uncomfortable, wearing um, your your cleats or whatever you call it, in the or wearing say screw-in footy boots? What would be more uncomfortable walking into a cafe? <laughs> um, I'd say probably footy boots. This is not. There's no one else. I'd say the lycra is a cafe, bigger issue there. Forget about the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> no, lycra is no issue, mate. Hang on a lycra second. Is no issue. Yeah. Okay. Hang on a second. Did you just say that you've been up and about riding? I don't think you've been to bed when out riding. Is that another way of looking at it? Oh, look, I probably didn't tell the whole truth just now. I um, I did push the boat out a little bit last night. Um, and uh, look, let's just say I finished at half past. And we'll just leave it at that, eh? I threw you under the bus there, Drew. You do sound a, bit, under the bus there, Drew you sound a bit throaty, don't you, Drew? I'm just hoping it's not COVID. It's it, just a, no, a hangover, It's eh? not the rona. It's just too many coronas. That's all. Okay. <laughs> very, very good. Okay, uh, let's chat some rugby. Biggest story this week making headlines. I know you all would have seen it. The trio at the Queensland Reds. We're talking about Harry Hawkins, Isaac Lucas, and Isaac Rodder, probably the biggest name in amongst those three. They are chosen to leave the Reds set up. Issues with the JobKeeper payment and the pay cut that they weren't happy with. Their managers played a big part in this. Hoylesey, what did you make of it? Yeah, well, it wasn't a good look, Lou. You, you got the impression as soon as it happened that there was a play to potentially get out of their contract and, and most likely get overseas. Uh, look, you, you never begrudge a player trying to make as much money as possible in, in a short career, but I really think on this one that um, I personally feel as though they've got it wrong and I think their names are going to be tarnished. And, and I don't know all those guys. I, I know the Lucas family pretty well. They've come, you know, that's a really good family, well-raised, good parents, good siblings, all that sort of stuff. I was disappointed to see that because he's a guy that I thought was probably on the cusp in the next six to 18 months of probably playing a Wallaby test for the very first time. And, and, and that's, taken a, you know, that's taken a huge hit now, whether or not he you know, gets back in that situation sooner or later, who knows. But I would have thought if I was in that situation and I didn't, wasn't happy with my financial situation that you would have been able to go and handle this some other way. You could have walked into the club. You could have had a meeting with the CEO. You could have had a meeting with the coach. I just didn't think it was a very good look for the game. And, and uh, unfortunately, I think those guys are, you know, they're, they're copping a fair bit of heat for it now. And I'd love to hear their side of the story because they've been quiet up until now. But it's not something I would have done personally. And um, it's, a, it's not a good look in my opinion. Yeah, I, I think you got it right there, Steve. I think the fact that we haven't heard from them has made it worse. I think if you know, like like you say, you can't really begrudge someone for making a decision on, uh, you know, on, on their, their financial future and stability, I suppose. But um, I mean, whilst they've been giving, been getting advice from their manager, like they've still got to own this decision. They've still got to be like they, they've still got to be the ones to say yes, go ahead with it. And so then just come out into the media and just and just front up and own the decision you made. At least talk to us as to what you're facing, what were the decisions were, and the and the um and the different sort of variables in it, and and just and just own it. And I think, I think if you if they came out and were actually at, at somewhat present, um to you know like, um so people could have at least a little bit of an understanding, I think it probably would have gone down a little bit better than it has. But I think by just saying nothing, it's uh it's made it even it's made uh, I guess the optics even worse. 
You read between the lines there, though, it would appear that there's been a bit of a uh, simmering tension beneath the surface between Rodder and coach Brad Thornton for a little while. Now he missed out on the captaincy earlier in the year. Back to your point, Halsey, around uh, Zach Lucas. Like you, I know the I know Maddie and Tommy quite well, and uh, I, th- I think we might be getting a bit too far ahead of ourselves saying that these guys' names will be tarnished. They shouldn't long term I don't think I think it's a, it's a little misstep now I, I'm on board with you that but I don't think long term I mean it's well, there's a history of guys who and um, girls who get it wrong on occasion but they can come back to the fold I don't think this will have too many long long term issues for these guys at least I hope not we should be allowed to have a little misstep here and there absolutely like that's why Drew's point again we want to hear what they have to say because th- there's always going to be an opportunity for forgiveness like there's been so many players that have done so much worse in terms of you know off-field indiscretions that have come back and had successful stories so i just one of the things that gets under my skin this day and age is is play managers play a powerful role in, in rugby and that's fine they've always been around and they serve a purpose but i was always of the belief that the play manager works for the for the player and i think now that there's some agents out there anthony Bacconi, to his credit he gets his players some very good deals he's very successful getting his players up to japan or overseas and and they make big money. But at the same time, I always feel that the manager works for the player. At the end of the day, the player's decision, it's his name, it's his career. So you've got to be mindful with what advice you get given. And, and at some stage, you, you essentially, you have to be really comfortable with that decision you make. So your manager can go out and do all the deals in the world they want to do for you, but it's your decision because it's your name that they're signing off on. And um, that's probably the, the thing you're looking at now. You're seeing what appears to be a, a decision that's guided by an agent and the players have, have backed the age. And I, again, I feel uh, if I was a player in that situation, I couldn't help but push back on that. What about the players around these guys at the moment? How do you think they're feeling? I mean, the Queensland Reds in particular, three major players leaving, and you talk about sort of being welcomed back. Is there any hard feelings from a player's point of view in these situations? Uh, I think it goes back to, again, what, they, what the, these three players have said to their teammates or their former teammates now. If they've come out and, and addressed the team and uh, and told them the reasons why, and I, I think it just really it comes down to providing clarity. And if if they're able to sort of sit down with their teammates and just sort of explain to them the story or the situation, then I think they've got a better chance of the team being a bit more understanding. Because it, you know it's it's been a year which has been heavily disrupted. There's not a great deal of clarity for the team going forward, and so um, you know to now have three players leave their, um, I guess, their list so late before this domestic competition that's approaching. Um, you know, it's, it's a tough one for the Reds. I, I also go back to the, the Isaac Rodder part about he was unhappy with Brad Thorne about missing, the, like, the captaincy. Like, this here, like, this isn't the, the work of a leader in my mind. Like, Isaac Rodder, if, you, if he was serious about being a captain of a super rugby team like the Reds now and he's got upset by not getting it and they, they overlook him to get Liam Wright, the way he's handled this is not uh, a leader, like not sort of leadership qualities, in my opinion. Can I just ask you guys this very quickly? Let me just ask you this. Uh, let's say that the three of them are unhappy with the way things have panned out and they independently go to QRU and say, on the quiet, and say, listen, we're not real happy with uh, the direction that everything's headed here. Can we go? We've got something lined up in Japan or France or wherever. Is your take on this different if that's their approach? Yeah, completely. And I, I I don't know exactly what the players have signed off on in terms of their their pay cut they've taken, but I'm under the impression that come June 30, if Rugby Australia can't honour their contracts for this year and next year, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Drew, but wouldn't you assume as a player that, he, that if they can't honour what they've got for next year on the table, then you're probably free to look around anyway. Yeah. So that's why I found this yeah. so surprising that in maybe you know, eight weeks' time or when, whenever it is, maybe a bit longer, that every player will be able to potentially put their hand up and say, well, sorry, that's what I signed for. You can't pay me that anymore. I get the option to look elsewhere. Maybe, and, and again, this is why an Anthony Bacconi is a, is a successful agent in Japan is because he's probably got ahead of it all. And he said, look, guys, if you want to get into Japan on this top dollar, you've got to get there soon. If you're not there in the next four weeks, you're going to lose out because the, the South Africans, the Kiwis, are all going to be looking for these type of deals. So... Again, like it, it's it's good work from the agent, but at the same time, it just doesn't look good on behalf of these young guys who, Australian rugby, Dave Rennie would have wanted these guys there or thereabouts in his squad. Rodder, we know, is a proven test player. Hawkins, 
was on the cusp. You know, he's a giant of a young man. He's got huge potential. And we've seen young Zachy Lucas, like we've seen him carve up for four years and he's only 20 or 21 years of age. So um, it's a shame. And I'll also probably make the point that you've got to be mindful when you're playing that, and, and everyone's a bit different, but you, money is always going to be there and you can get paid as well as you can. But you essentially, you, you're going to make your money in life after rugby. I, I've always felt that, you know, there's probably two or three percent of the Wallabies we've seen in the last 20 or 30 years that have done well enough in their professional rugby career to, 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 to live off that really. You know, not many people can finish rugby and go, well, that's it, I'm out, I don't need to work anymore. So I think you've always got to be mindful of, you know, your reputation and your name along the way. Okay, so here's my question. Young guys, all three of them are, especially the Harry Hawkins and Isaac Lucas. You go to Japan in a comp that's not as strong, you would say, as super rugby. You go potentially to France and England, obviously a little bit stronger, but Japan particularly, because that seems to be where everyone is talking about these guys might go. Are they going to get the same out of their rugby by going to Japan? Are they therefore missing the opportunity of staying here, being around mates, being in the Australian system? You mentioned Hoylesey. It's kind of can be not all about money. It is a lot, but you know maybe for some players it's not. Are they going to be doing the right thing for their rugby careers from a skills point of view by going somewhere like Japan? Well, Drew's played overseas. He's probably best to answer this. So I pr- probably think you know Australian rugby's got so much uncertainty at the moment that, that maybe, you know, getting overseas and playing in a comp is going to be better. But, Drew, you've played there. Like, you know, there's different forms of competition all around the world. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, it depends on where you, where you land. Uh, in France um, and sort of the UK and those types of um, competitions, you actually you play a hell of a lot of games. Um, I think, you know, for Toulon, when we went through to the final of both competitions, we played 42 games that, that season. So... Like that's that's a long graft. Um, whereas Japan, it's it's not as much. But then I'm told the training is significantly more difficult in, in Japan than it was um, for for us in France. You mean you mean they actually train in Japan <laughs> rather than just playing like you did in France? I mean they actually do train. <laughs> they didn't drink <laughs> piss at lunchtime, did they? Yeah, well, that's right. well, yeah. I mean we we had a good coach, and he said, look, there's too many opportunities to get injured in games, so we won't do any contact at training. So for four years. I didn't have to make a tackle at training and probably reflected in not making too many tackles in games. But um, I, I think it depends. It depends on where they land. Um, I mean, we, I even just I saw a quote this week from uh, Sam Whitelock, who's been playing up in the Japanese competition. He actually seems to think that the top two or three teams in that, um, in that Japanese league would probably um, compete with the Super Rugby size. So I think the influx of internationals plus the, the growth of the Japanese players uh, that competition's certainly getting better, um, and then like we're seeing South Africa, there's Exodus, there's players from all around the world landing in um, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, England, and and also France as well. So I think with so many f- foreigners now leaving their own shores to go play in those competitions, they're just going to get better and better. Before COVID hit, uh, the squad lists for those top line teams they read like barbarian sides. They were that strong. And the Japanese players, there are a couple of up-and-coming Japanese players in there, but for the most part, they were test players as well. So I reckon that the quality of footy that you're getting in Japan at the moment is equal of anywhere in the world. Yeah, if I was a young guy, though, I, I think I would probably lean towards going to the Premiership or playing up in the UK just because you see the, the facilities, the resources, the coaching, the infrastructure that these clubs in the Premiership have. You just have to look at the improvement in the Northern Hemisphere nations over the last decade. At the start of our career, I didn't really look like I had no interest in playing in the Premiership because I thought Australian rugby was the best place to be to improve your rugby, playing in the Super, in the super Rugby competition. Uh, Japan looks as though it's probably traditionally been a place for people at the end of their careers to go, but you are seeing some younger players go and develop. But yeah, from a Harry Hawkins and, and Isaac Lucas... It's an odd decision to potentially go, and we're just assuming, to potentially go to Japan. I, I think they'd be better served if they were to leave Australia to head up to one of the top tier teams in the Premiership or in Ireland, for example. Okay, so assuming we do see uh, not only these players, but other players head overseas, what are we doing with the Mitchell Law? We've renamed it on this show. And also, uh, Scott Johnson has said that potentially we might need to implement more of a transfer system like we see 
in football around the world. Uh, Drew, do you have any thoughts on how this could work? I mean, yeah, look, it, it's, it's not an easy um, problem to solve, I, I think. It's, um, you know, in some ways, I just don't think that there should be um, a need for a, a, a ghetto law or anything like that where, you know, like in every, at every age group, going through from a, a young rugby player all the way through, every representative team is the best picked available. And then you get to the ultimate representative team in the Wallabies and they only pick the best available in your country. Like there's, if there's still better Australians playing elsewhere, they're not, they're not picked. I, I just, I don't, I can't get my head around that. I just think, I understand about, you know, the, having the best players uh, playing in Australia. But I also think with the game, with where we're at at the moment and the need for, for, for wins and, um, you know, the, to, to re-engage with um, perhaps some rugby supporters that are just tired of not seeing us, um, you know, collecting trophies and things. I, I think there's more of a need now to have the best players playing in the Wallaby jersey, no matter where they're playing their club, um, their club rugby. Yeah, the, the whole idea of, you know, protecting or players not being able to get picked from overseas unless they played, you know, 60 odd tests was to protect the quality of super rugby in Australia. And that, that's gone out the window at the moment. Like the priority has to be to protect the Wallabies and make them as strong as possible. So yeah, I was always for making sure the best players stayed in, in Australian rugby because we needed super rugby to be competitive because it was hanging on by a thread. Well, you know, I, we all think that that needs, that thread's been cut loose and you know, we need to start again. So I'm all for players, at least for a 24 month period, we got to pick the best. Like if Will Skelton was at that World Cup campaign, like things could have been, you know, dramatically different. We don't know, but I'm just saying, like, there's so many good players that are playing overseas. Like Scott Fardy, potentially in the form of his career, like he's been involved in, you know, two really successful campaigns for Leinster, and you know we don't get to see him. So, yeah, let those guys play in a Wallaby jersey as much as possible. In terms of a transfer fee, I think there's already something there in in some type of World Rugby regulation, but yeah, we've got to be, I feel like we're a little bit hypocritical when we're saying there should be a transfer fee. Like, you know, we're, we're the ones that have, you know, half our side are made up of Pacific Islanders. We've got Tongans, Samoans, Fijians. So, you know, I don't think that's really something that Australian rugby should be saying, we, we deserve, you know, this because we've developed him. Like, to be fair, we haven't done the type of um, recruitment as actively as what, say, New Zealand do with Fiji. And, like, New Zealand have scouts, NRL have scouts in Fiji, we're probably just lucky that Australia is a country that they move to and then they play their rugby. So I still don't think you know, we should be putting a hand out for any payments because we've developed you know, certain Pacific Islanders, for example. Uh, domestic competition, guys. Earmarked for a July 4th start at this stage. Uh, Scott Johnson again has said uh, that they might have an answer within a week or so as to how this all looks. Are you confident that we're going to get to a domestic comp? in this uh, current climate we're in? I think we'll see some type of footy. Um, yeah, I mean, it's looking like it's going to be some type of domestic competition. I, I saw that um, the Sunwolves have been told that they won't be included in it. So I think we're getting closer to having a decision and it's most likely going to be the Australian teams. Again, I don't know if the force have yet been contacted or not after speaking about that last episode. But um, I, look, I think we're going to see some... Uh, some footy with the Australian teams, and, and I hope we do. I mean, it's we're starting to see other competitions and other sports starting, and there's a little bit of um, envy and a bit of bit of jealousy, a little bit, you know, like that uh, we're not able to see the game that we love, and so hopefully it's not too far away for us. I'm going to float one here. I would like to see a Barbarians team assembled for whatever domestic competition gets aligned, and I don't just want 15s players. I want some of the Aussie men's seven squad. In fact, why not all of them who can cover back line and back row positions tossed in, grab a couple of up-and-coming quality grey players from around the traps, and away we go with another team. Let's see how some of the guys that you've helped coach, Hoylesy, from the World of Sevens go up against the best in 15s, because I reckon a few of them might shock a few. Yeah, I, I made this suggestion with Timmy Walsh not long ago, and I, I don't think it had much luck at, at head office, but... Uh, the, the thing is, you're going to have at least four or five teams that are that are going to have players that aren't getting a run because they've got squads of 35, and those guys can't even go back and play club rugby if that does kick off because of the whole COVID security type thing. Once they're in the Waratahs program or the Reds, they've got to stay there. They can't jump in between their club just because of the risk of, the, of COVID. So 
if, for example, every one of those states lent the Australian sevens one or two front rowers, props and hookers, and second rowers, the sevens just need a tight five. Other than that, they've got enough players that can cover back row all the way out to uh, to fullback. And, and all these guys have played 15s, of course. They're, they are sevens players at the moment, but most of these guys have grown up playing sevens. So, yeah, I think that would be a great idea, Shawnee, if you could somehow get them involved because they're, they're a program at the moment that's sitting there and feel, feel as though they're kind of getting the least love out of anyone. And, and I can half understand why because the Olympics is their priority. Their World Series is their tournament they play in. So the international travel's shot to bits at the moment, but they've got to try and get them ready for the Olympics next year. So they almost said, well, Sevens, you guys have months and months to get ready, but they're still in Australia training. So, yeah, if you could find another side between them naming the Australian Barbarians, lend them some tight five from the other states. So that way those players get some games and um, we just get to see more more teams on, on TV. Mm. So a few, few articles are rolling around uh, in the past week or so about some potential rule changes or ideas around rule changes. Sean, are there any that you'd like to see implemented? Uh, the one that keeps bouncing up time and time again, and it was shared last week by Wallaby's assistant defensive coach, uh, Matty Taylor, was the scrums take forever to get cracking. I know a lot of the people that are helping us put this little spot together, or help you guys put this spot together, rather, uh, are furious at how long it takes a scrum to get set. That sucks up so much time. And when you see a match closed out, five from home with scrums just being reset, reset time and time again, that's one that's got to be fixed. And I kind of like the one that we had, oh, where was it, uh, team? It was either Global Rapid Rugby or might have been NRC where it was the, was it the 50-20? You kick the touch, fine touch. It was like the 40-20 equivalent for rugby league, but implemented in rugby. I thought that had some merit too. Yeah, I, I'll echo the, the scrum one. I think maybe even um, just start the clock when the ball's available at the, at the back of the scrum or something like that. Like, so there's still a, a genuine contest and we don't take away from perhaps a couple of resets or whatever, but just make sure that the, the, um, the clock only starts when the ball's available because we just want more ball in play time. We, we're, we're just, there's too much time in, in our game at the moment where we're losing it through scrum resets or getting to a line out or, you know, like just time that is just dead time. And I think if we can better manage the, the clock, in terms of just when the ball's in play and when it's available, then I think we'll actually start seeing a little bit more rugby as well. Yeah, I'm in complete agreement with the scrum. Yeah, the, one of the things you see during COVID is you see the, the replays of all the games gone. And it was only 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, where there was, as soon as the, the penalty or the half arm was awarded, like 10 seconds later, the ball was in and out. I'd also like to add in that the, number, the opposition number nine can't come past halfway of the scrum and harass the back of the scrum because... All you've really seen as, as a result of that is no back row moves. And I say that because I'm a, a biased old back row. Yeah. But I did. I, I really think that back row moves was a part of the game that, you know, added another dimension to, to what was, you know, what used to be a part of the game where you had to think. You had to use your brain to try and think of where the blind winger was and if you could pull a move to potentially isolate him. So I'd love to see that. I don't know about the – I've heard the one about potentially eliminating the marks in the 22 – Part of me likes that idea, but then I also think if we go down that path, you'll just have sides bombing the crap out of a fullback, so it'll just be too much kick in. So um, maybe definitely speed up scrums, potentially speed up lineouts. Um, but yeah, they've got to look at something. And again, the problem with trying to tweak laws in rugby, it's not like the NRL, we can just you know, have a meeting with the NRL commission and we make a law change, you know how hard it is in rugby, but at least we can try and demonstrate that we're trying to make, make some changes. Okay, from an international rugby point of view, interesting idea um, that was floating around around the rugby championship later this year. Rob Clark, the Rugby Australia CEO, has confirmed that SANS are, are looking at a, a hub model for the rugby championship because Australia is sort of doing particularly well in the coronavirus situation. They're putting up the idea and making the plans that a hub could be here for the rugby championship between South Africa, Argentina, Australia and New Zealand, a bit of a mini World Cup vibe. That sounds pretty cool way to end uh, the year and get some international rugby on our screens and on the fields, potentially even crowds could come back around October, November, guys. Yeah, I mean, I think if, if it's an opportunity for us to see international rugby, then um, and it's one that's actually viable and the, the Argentinian team is able to come here, South Africa as well, and, and obviously New Zealand, then I'm, I'm all for it. I mean, 
Uh, yeah, I, I read that as well, where they're talking about just sort of consecutive weeks. Like that's the, essentially sort of the, the World Cup model. So they'll probably you know, play over sort of six or seven weeks or something and just it's nutted out in, in, one, uh, in one go. I, I think it'd be fantastic if it's all in sort of one area. Uh, you can really get around it, really make it sort of like a rugby festival. Um, again, uh, it's, it's about how many people are allowed to be there and social distancing and all that sort of stuff. But at least it, it, they'd be able to come up with some creative ways to, to really engage. Um, with either the, the viewers or the, or the people that are um, going there to watch, if that's possible. Where would you have it, mate? Where would you have your little festival? Well, I was going to offer up. I was going to offer up the beaches, but you want Coogee? Yeah, oh, let's go Coogee Oval. No harm done. Everyone stay at the Crown Plaza. Lock them down. Coogee Bay below you. Pavilion. There's there's <laughs> options everywhere. Now, look, I don't. I'm I'm not sure where they play. Like, but I, I what I do reckon is. Uh, this is a really good time because there's no other domestic competitions going on. So all your best players, like let's look at Fiji, for example, they hardly ever get their best team together because they're all contracted you know, to the powerful clubs in Europe. Let's try and include Fiji in a tournament like that. Let's get their best players out and let them spend mm. six weeks together in camp playing against South Africa and Australia and, and Argentina. And that, that'll that really help the islands because as I said that the, the biggest problem with those teams when they get to the World Cup is they've hardly spent any time together and like Samoa and Tonga I think get two or three tests a year if they're lucky and one of those tests is against the top tier nation so now might be a good time to to get all the best players in the world back into a little bubble like you know Australia New Zealand or Fiji probably not Fiji because they don't have enough uh, top quality fields but it's it's a, it's a time to be creative, and I think we could we could look at adding one of the Pacific teams into that. Yeah, and I guess the idea is that if um it doesn't get up, the Bledisloe might be extended to maybe four tests, two in Australia, two in New Zealand. That's not a bad second option if the travel restrictions are still uh, quite strict come October, November. Uh, do you agree, Drew? Uh, I just think why why make it four? Like either keep it three or make it five. Like you'd, there's no point going through all this and then having potentially two and two and then then they just get to retain it like i, I just mm. <laughs> I, I i just think either make it three or make it five but i do i do like the idea obviously of of having a blitters like though this year i like the idea of a 15 test blitters though series if this first <laughs> thing doesn't get off the ground maybe queenstown sean like maybe queenstown <laughs> middle of ski season i don't know so, like small bit of jet boating small crowd, bit of fly fishing boating. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah right yeah. Okay, I like that. I think there's some work to be done on that. We can we can work with it, though. Um, okay, so obviously we're all looking forward to rugby coming back. You can hear from all of us talking about it. We're just waiting for those dates to, to come along. I want to talk about some comebacks, maybe, in your guys' careers. Um, Hoylesey, is there something that comes to mind, either in your career or just that you've seen? No, you know, there was a game on the other night, which was the South African test. Sorry, it was a Welsh test. First test of the year in 2007, um, and I, I I scored the match winning try, and it was a memorable <laughs> moment. But I, I don't think I did. I did I actually. I, I know I didn't do very much at all. Dan Vickerman never scored a test try, and I think he was so pissed off at me that he passed me the ball in that last last pass to score that try. He probably could have scored it himself, the big fella. But that was a, you know, that was my first sort of. I think it was my first home test actually, because I yeah, it was my first home test and. Came on with five minutes to go. We were down by a point against Wales and scored in the corner. That was pretty good. I, I played in a few games where I think I played in a game for the Brumbies where we might have been up 21 nil after about 15 minutes against the Force last game of the year and we ended up losing. So that wasn't a, a comeback game that it was good to be a part of. But nothing, I don't know. I haven't really given too much thought, Lou. You put me on the spot there. So I'd have to maybe go to Drew and Shawnee and I, I might think of something else. But there's probably been some other ones, fellas. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I've been in, on too many teams where we've actually been the, the, the team that's made the comeback. I think maybe more often than not, I've been in the team that sort of started well and then just sort of closed up shop and, uh, and we got run down. But I remember, uh, the, remember the, uh, the game where Kirtley Bill kicked the, the winning goal in the high veld? We got out to like 31 mm. nil or 31 six or something just before half time. And then, <laughs> and then they just ran us down. Like, and then that, we were then down by, I don't know, 15 points or something. And then we came back right on the end, but um, so that that was, I guess, a memorable finish. But yeah, unfortunately, my time at the Force and and even the Reds and I think maybe even a couple at the Waratahs as well. 
I'd be on those teams where we'd get off to a good start and get start getting pretty uh, pretty happy with ourselves, and then just sort of shut up shop and and then get run down. Are these are these specifically on field, or do they incorporate off as well? What's the what's the lay of the land here? If if you're going to talk off field, come back, Sean. Then we just talk every Sunday <laughs> on a seventh tour for you because you have you have been essentially dead on several occasions and somehow managed to claw your way out of some licensed premises. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in the middle of a comeback right now. <laughs> the the one that's the one that still sticks with me was from a couple of years back in Vegas, and my back was in all sorts. Like I've had some back issues, as each of you know, over a long period of time, and it was horrific. And I dosed up too heavily on uh, some pain medication, slept through my alarm. Had a leg it like when I say leg it like kind of penguin walk through the casino where we were staying at the Luxor, th- showering money on the cab driver to get out to the ground. Uh, crawled into Did the you commentary stop and have box. Have a whack on the machine, Sean. In that rush? Did you have a little? <laughs> I, had a, I, had a, I had a I had a quick go at the Queen of the Nile. Yeah, <laughs> little slap. Uh, crawled in, crawled into the commentary box, and then Perry Baker went on to score one of the most insane tries I've ever seen going 110 against Fiji. So I called all that, but then had no recollection till about six weeks later when someone said, hey, what about you doing the Perry Baker try? No recollection, lost the whole day. The turn goes to Baker. Baker right on his own try line. Perry Baker from 100 out. Perry Baker. Perry Baker goes back in field. Is he going to take it 100? Baker. Oh, this is just... I reckon you've all done pretty well there with the comebacks. As we said, we're just waiting to uh, have actual live, proper rugby comeback. So cannot wait for that. Guys, we had a comeback too. We've got an episode two. Yeah. Do you reckon it'll go to air? Actually, you know what's so good about this Uh, is that no one can actually pull us off the air. We just do this ourselves, don't we? (laughs) Yes, we do. We essentially, we can't get boned. Look, I... I, (laughs) Got to say that. Give a little heads up for next week, team. <laughs> next Friday, I'm booked in to get all four of my wisdom teeth taken out. So, uh, when we when we record this, I might uh, be a little bit swollen and perhaps not able to talk too much. But I'm I'll front up, and then you guys can can make the decision whether they just you just kick me off or if I try and push through. But um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna have some pretty. So that's a bit odd, Drew. So like most people when they're coming and you're coming back to play rugby next year, of course, in yeah. USA, and most people when they're trying to go on huge, you know comebacks and weight losses get lap band surgery but you're getting your teeth pulled out so you don't eat yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm going out just got a bit of uh yeah bone broth and I, look anything to rip up right I just, I just need to shred up a little bit that's why i'm wearing black because it's slimming like it's all the little tricks of the trade that is commitment though <laughs> getting and, teeth and drew if you need any right. help with that pain uh that pain management i'm happy to give you a hand on that front too <laughs> yeah sweet i'll just halve of what everything anything you ever had <laughs> On that note, guys, thanks so much for your company again. Thanks so much wherever you're watching as well for your company too. Hope you can join us next time and make sure you hit subscribe and get into contact with us on Facebook as well. See you soon.